Okay, it is seven o'clock. I'm still letting people in, but I figured I would get started so everybody can get out of here on time and get into their weekend. Hi everyone, my name is Elizabeth Smith. I am the Watershed Programs Manager at Donebrook Watershed Partnership. And uh, welcome to our Zoom talk, A History of Lower Lake. I would like to thank our partners for this, uh, the Shaker Historical Society, the Shaker Library, the Cleveland Heights Historical Society, and the Heights Library for helping to spread the word and let y'all know that this is happening where you can learn a little history in your own backyard. And uh, I ask that everybody please mute if you can. And I'm gonna turn it over to Tori Mills, who is the director of the organization I work at. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Elizabeth. Uh, hi, I'm Tori and I just wanna welcome everyone as well. And I also have the honor of introducing our speakers tonight. John Barber and Peggy Spaeth have been spearheading a tremendous habitat restoration effort at Lower Lake, the Friends, they're the co-chairs of the Friends of Lower Lake. Peggy Spaeth is the retired founding executive director of Heights Arts, a nonprofit community arts organization. She's involved with several habitat restoration projects, including Heights Pollinator Pathway and the B Bradford Cinderpath and was recently appointed to the Cleveland Heights Parks and Recreation Board. In the end, she wants everyone to take responsibility for a piece of healthy green space. I agree with that. John Barber has been a citizen scientist for over 50 years, active in green space preservation, the recovery of pe peregrine falcon populations and the continuing recovery of Eastern bluebirds. A native of Shaker Heights, he served on the board of the Nature Center for 10 years, including two terms as board president. Now retired after 35 years in the business world, he is focused on restoring and maintaining biodiversity. He continues studies on bluebirds and performs habitat restoration and ecological gardening with native plants. So you, as you heard, they're very, um, we know them well for digging into the earth that they're restoring, but tonight we're in for a real treat because I know they've been hard at work digging into history and will uh, have a lot of, I think, new things for us to learn about our near and dear lower Shaker Lake. So take it away, guys. Thanks. Thank you very much, Tori, and good evening, everyone. I'm John Barber, co-chair, along with my partner, Peggy Spaeth, of the Friends of Lower Lake, an all-volunteer program of the Donebrook Watershed Partnership. And we've been working around the habitat of Lower Lake now for four years, four seasons. Uh, but the two of us go back to uh, being present around Lower Lake uh, deep into the last century. And so we're very familiar with it and how it's changed over the last 50 to 60 years. But when we started working there, we wanted to go a little further back. And that's uh, the result of that research is what we'd like to talk about tonight. Uh, to start off, though, there are some acknowledgments that we want to say publicly. Uh, we've gone back to a lot of original sources uh, wherever we can and got a lot of help from our local history community. Tom Edwards at the Cleveland Public Library Map Room, Elaine Haroon at the Public Administration Library in City Hall, Megan Hayes, the local historian at the Shaker Heights Public Library, Jack Ullman, the last Commodore of the Canoe Club. The Shaker Lakes Garden Club, which has provided so much history and support over the four years we've been working there. Kara Hamley O'Donnell from Shaker Heights, Karen Knittel from Cleveland Heights, and a lot of authors, particularly from the Cleveland Heights Historical Society, who have done so much research and published article after article in the Historical Society's newsletter, A View from the Overlook. And many other local historians have also provided uh, good background information on the topic we're gonna cover tonight. Tonight's topic is Lower Lake. It's in the Doan Brook watershed, and it is part of an Audubon designated important bird area for migratory and residential birds. Lower Lake is in the middle of the Donebrook watershed, and it used to be part of the largest system in the city of Cleveland, uh, largest park system in the city of Cleveland, the Shaker Parklands. Uh, 
In the 1940, the parklands covered 296 acres within the 7,500 acre Donebrook watershed. And today, Lower Lake is still owned by the city of Cleveland, but it is leased to Cleveland Heights and Shaker Heights for maintenance. The nature center at Shaker Lakes is just upstream of Lower Lake, but it's not responsible uh, for the lake. Uh, before Euro European settlement, the site of Lower Lake was a forested ravine. And indeed over 95% of Ohio uh, was forested prior to the arrival of European settlers. In Northeast Ohio, the Native American communities used this area, we think, as hunting grounds. The Iroquois coming down from the Northeast and all the Delaware tribes and subfamilies uh, coming in from the West. And when the European settlers arrived in Northeast Ohio, they claimed and occupied the land, or they claimed the land occupied by the Native Americans through what one writer called unwelcome treaties and paltry payments. The early settlers were mostly uh, surveyors who were laying out township lines and also inventorying trees for logging. The most common trees found in this 1795 to 1805 period uh, were white oaks and maples, beeches, and of course, the now gone American chestnut. Uh, this 1858 map uh, shows the site of the North Union Shaker settlement in the Shaker Parklands. Uh, the Shakers uh, purchased a farmland here in 1822 and set up three families in this area. Lower Lake was created when they dammed the Doan Brook. Uh, some dams might have been put in before the big one, but in 1836, a 500 foot dam was put in to drive a sawmill. And upstream, of course, the Doan Brook was dammed again to create Horseshoe Lake. The Shakers further deforested this area after the initial logging uh, to set up farming and pasture land for their sheep and cattle. And they used the trees and the rocks and the clay that they found here to build the earthen dams. Lower Lakes Earthen Dam, uh, now out of compliance with Ohio Department of Natural Resources standards, uh, was created to drive a sawmill that could cut oak. So just an enormous amount of water power was harnessed uh, to run the sawmill. And this hand-drawn map uh, from a publication by Marilyn Miller uh, looks at the North family, which was one of the three families in the North Union Shaker village. And this is the family, the North family or the Mill family, they were also known as, um, occupied the west end of Lower Lake and created Lower Lake. So on the right side of our screen here is Lower Lake with a 500 foot earthen uh, and log and rock dam stopping up the Doan Brook um, to uh, create enough water power to drive the sawmill, which is just on the other side of the dam. Uh, and if you cross the dam now, you will be on Brook Road also known as Lover's Lane. Uh, and the original Shaker site, when they built the dam, they had two exits out the west end of Lower Lake. One exit is the exit that we have today, or at least an approximation of it, which is the southern exit where the Doan Brook uh, goes under the 1897 bridge, under Coventry Boulevard, and down into the gorge. But when the sawmill was active, there was a second exit to the lake. And there was a water gate at the uh, south exit of the lake. And that water gate could be closed, forcing water to rush more furiously uh, into the sawmill, drive the sawmill, and then eventually make its way back down into the main uh, Doan Brook uh, Gorge. So at its peak, the North Union Shaker Village had about 300 people in it, in three families spread out. This was the farthest west family. 
And those uh, 300 residents uh, peaked in the 1840s and 1850s. And as the elders began to die out and recruitment became more difficult for a variety of reasons, uh, the Shaker colony dwindled. And by 1889, the Shaker colony abandoned this area. Uh, by that time, there were less than 50 people living, 50 Shakers living in one of the family residences and the buildings themselves were falling down. Down in the gorge, further west from Lower Lake, uh, was the stone grist mill, a four or five story building, a very popular grist mill in its day. That was the only building that we know of that was built completely of stone. All the other Shaker buildings were built of wood. And that's one of the reasons why, in all probability, by uh, the 1890s, most of the buildings had either fallen down or been burned down or taken away uh, for other purposes right after the Shaker colony uh, abandoned this area. And here's a wonderful old postcard showing the old mill remains. This was a postcard printed in about 1915. Uh, if you look at the uh, sawmill foundation ruins today, and I'll show you a picture in a little while, uh, you'll see that even a lot of the rocks that were there in 1915 uh, were either taken away or sold away, and there's very little left in terms of uh, Shaker buildings. The North Union Shaker settlement was sold to a real estate uh, syndicate in 1892. Um, and at that point, um, it became clear that the lands of the Shaker Parklands and the former Shaker colony were going to be developed very, very quickly. Here's an 1898 map um, that shows the uh, extent of the Shaker uh, properties. And even in 1912, by 1912, we can already see that there's an awful lot of uh, real estate being laid out for development. But the two cities, Shaker Heights and Cleveland Heights, uh, are uh, establishing their boundaries uh, right down the middle of the lake. Of most importance uh, in terms of how did we get here um, is in 1896, the Shaker Heights Land Company of Buffalo, New York, uh, that owned most of the former Shaker colony, deeded 278 acres for Shaker Heights Park. At that point, uh, it was spelled H-I-G-H-T-S to match uh, one of the spellings that we see of the land company. But they deeded 278 acres to Cleveland for a park, January 1896. And one of the things I find so interesting is this was a very conditional transfer of land. Uh, the land was transferred to the city of Cleveland to be a park in perpetuity. And if it was no longer a park, if for any reason it was developed, uh, the deed would revert or convert back to the descendants of the original owners, the Shaker Heights Land Company. So there was a, a permanent uh, park language in there, but there was one more piece of language that's very important to our story tonight. And that is that the deed transfer uh, also said that the city of Cleveland, had to purchase parklands between the Shaker Parks and Lake Erie along the Doan Brook. And this was a requirement of the deed. A man by the name of John D. Rockefeller, whom you might have heard of, uh, upon hearing that this condition had been put in the deed in January of 1896, through an agent began buying up lands uh, in the Donebrook Gorge uh, between the Shaker Parklands and Wade Oval and Gordon Park to complete a string of parklands from the Shaker Parklands down to Lake Erie. The original deed that uh, deeded those 278 acres to Cleveland uh, said that Cleveland had six years to do that. But John D. Rockefeller, through an agent, to be very quiet about it, within six months had purchased enough land to donate 
the land to the city of Cleveland to meet the requirements of the deed. So by 1897, the Shaker Parklands were part of a long string of parkland uh, from the Shaker Lakes all the way down to Gordon Park. A wonderful uh, landscape gardener, E.W. Bowditch, uh, put together a plan in 1896, uh, working for the, the uh, Board of Park Commissioners, a newly formed group in Cleveland, Ohio, uh, to outline what the park could look like from Lake Erie on the right on this map, all the way out to Horseshoe Lake on the bottom left. And so lots of ideas started coming up. And, and Bowditch was one of a, a number of um, landscape architects and architects who looked at the incredibly popular success of Central Park, which was finished in the late 1870s, um, and said, we can do this in Cleveland also. So it was a very, very exciting uh, time to have this uh, master plan uh, go to paper. One of the other things that Mr. Bowditch did uh, was in uh, October of 1896, so just a few months after Rockefeller made his uh, gift uh, to the city, um, Bowditch spoke to the Chamber of Commerce. And I wanna read this because this is uh, such wonderful language. So Bowditch is explaining the possibilities of an entire park system in the city of Cleveland. He spoke of the old quarry in the Shaker property and incidentally remarked that one of the members of the chamber had asked what use that property could be put to for park purposes. Mr. Bowditch soon showed the audience what could be done with it. He first showed the old quarry in its present state and then had thrown on the canvas the picture of a park in Paris. Paris, built from just such a piece of property. The beautiful and picturesque effects thoroughly captivated the audience and when the speaker told them that the old quarry in Shaker Heights would be made just as beautiful and at no greater expense than required in beautifying the remainder of the grounds, they broke into rapturous applause. Wow, the plane dealer just couldn't get over itself here. And to my knowledge, this is probably one of the few instances where any Chamber of Commerce meeting has ended with uh, rapturous, uh, applause. So in 1897, uh, part of the Bowditch plan included an 1897 bridge uh, that goes across uh, the dam, the old Shaker Dam. This is the 1836 dam that we're talking about. And this 1897 bridge at that point would handle early automobiles and carriages. Uh, it has now been uh, narrowed down to a pedestrian bridge but you'll probably recognize the columns uh, on this bridge uh, as it stands today at Lower Lake. And we were fortunate, uh, fortunate enough to find at the Cleveland Public Library map collection some wonderful renderings uh, put together uh, to put this uh, uh, from August 1897, to put this bridge up at the west end of Lower Lake and let the spillway the, the spillway that didn't have anything to do with the sawmill go underneath the bridge the way it still does today. Uh, in 1907, a group of, of uh, men approached the city of Cleveland and said, we would like to form a canoe club. And we've picked Lower Lake as the home of our canoe club. Will you approve that? And the city uh, looked at it and said, yes, we will approve it. Uh, and Lower Lake was very attractive because it just had trolley service, uh, had just started up in around 1907 that could get people to and from Lower Lake. Uh, and also it was an inland lake and it didn't have some of the weather problems that Lake Erie would have for canoes or some of the issues that uh, the Ohio Canal might have uh, with barge traffic. It was an ideal place to have a canoe club. And so after that 1907 time, uh, the Canoe Club built a one-story uh, Canoe Club house on the south side. Uh, this colorized postcard is just marvelous. And one of the things I draw your attention to is the fact that the uh, banks of the lower lake, uh, in this postcard anyway, about 1910, uh, are uh, very, very grassy, and they make a, a natural 
a uh, place to sit if you're watching uh, regattas and carnivals. By 1911, um, actually a little bit earlier than that, the Van Swearingen's have, have uh, purchased uh, an awful lot of the land around uh, the Shaker Parklands. Other realty companies are starting to put up houses and the lake and canoeing and parkland is clearly a very big attractant in terms of developing and selling houses. Uh, this became very important um, from a marketing perspective uh, to have parklands nearby. Uh, <clears throat> in 1909 and 1911, there were uh, marvelous articles in the, in the uh, Plain Dealer and other newspapers uh, about carnivals on Shaker Lake and uh, regattas, races, jousting matches. Um, and the, uh, uh, this was newsworthy uh, at this time and uh, often published lots of pictures. Uh, and at some point between uh, 1908 and 1914, the Canoe Club decided that its uh, one-story building was really insufficient uh, for the popularity of canoeing on Lower Lake. So they approached the city and got permission to put up a new canoe club house. Uh, and this is the uh, second rendition of the canoe club house. It's a two-story house um, purportedly built by the members themselves, including the roof. Uh, the first floor had berths for 32 canoes that would come out uh, the sliding door uh, right under the porch. Uh, the second floor had a fireplace uh, in it a uh, brick fireplace in it, uh, as well as a rudimentary kitchen, a dance floor, uh, and then a big porch that opened out uh, over, over Lower Lake. And they inaugurated their new canoe club uh, with a carnival in uh, July of 1915. Uh, and then later on in 1915, uh, there was a story in the newspaper that just really caught our fancy. This is Miss Melba Foster from Corydon Road uh, over in Cleveland Heights. And she is demonstrating that canoeing is not dangerous at all, especially the second picture. She's leaning on the gunwale with a relaxed smile. She says it's just exciting. And one of the things that I love so much about this is that the newspaper published some advice on paddling something we don't see very often these days. And in this, uh, at the bottom of this article, um, she's cautioning us not to sit too far back. In the middle, she's telling us, don't step into a canoe this way. And in the drawing on the bottom right, this is the way you dress. Uh, this is the way you step into a canoe safely. And all of this was done wearing a dress. In 1923, and one of the uh, regattas. Uh, the canoe club members engaged in til a tilting competition, uh, which you may be familiar with perhaps from knights in armor riding horses trying to unseat each other. This was almost the same thing minus the horses in armor. One uh, person would stand on the gunnels, uh, they'd paddle directly at each other and try to knock the other one out of the canoe. Uh, wonderful time. Uh, but please uh, don't try this at home and don't try this on Lower Lake. In 1924, the Van Swearingen Company, uh, in its advertisements for the Shaker Village development, uh, housing development all around the Parklands, called out the fact that uh, this involved a canoe club in this development, as well as a chain of lakes and more than 300 acres of parklands. And so you can see that while the Shakers were focused entirely on this area for industry, when the, when the mass housing development started in, in the uh, 1910s uh, and ran till about 1935 or 1940, during this time of rapid housing development, the Parklands were seen as a boom uh, and a real amenity for housing development. And and uh, all through this time, the Canoe Club was wildly successful, taking on canoe clubs from Solon and Rocky River and uh, other places in races and, and uh, uh, jousting. Uh, and by the way, the Canoe Club was not particularly elite. 
uh, its members paid $15 a year in membership dues and that allowed them to, to uh, store a canoe uh, on the first floor. And they did all the building maintenance themselves. There were moonlight carnivals and canoeing lessons uh, for Boy Scouts, uh, resulting in Lower Lake having boats on it practically all the time. We also uh, uncovered the fact that the Canoe Club building was not the only construction on Lower Lake uh, in this period. Uh, sometime around 1910, the city of Cleveland built a rowboat dock, a boathouse, and a refreshment stand across the way on North Park Boulevard. And that's seen here on the left uh, in this postcard. Uh, and the bottom two uh, postcards uh, show the boat dock with some canoes and some rowboats and lots of people, uh, and also the refreshment stand tucked back up in. Uh, and I, again, I draw your attention to the fact that the banks are, are uh, pretty wide open so that uh, spectators, sometimes three to 5,000 spectators for regattas, had a place to sit and watch the boat races. The boathouse and refreshment stand are long gone. Uh, as I'll show you in a little while, we think that they disappeared uh, well before the 1930s. Um, and in recent times, when the lake has been drained, uh, we've searched just offshore looking for some of the foundations of uh, perhaps the dock and uh, any other remnants of the refreshment stand in the boathouse. Uh, but we've had no success in finding that. We did find, however, in the wonderful Cleveland Library map room, uh, the plans at Lower Shaker Lake for the boathouse and refreshment booth. And they just show the care that was taken for amenities around the lake. What we have found off of North Park, and some of you may have seen this before, uh, are two sets of stone stairs uh, going from the crest of the hill on North Park down toward the lake. And although we found no proof of this yet, uh, we think that perhaps these steps at one point uh, led down to the boathouse and the refreshment stand. Starting with Ernest Bowditch in 1896, uh, there were a series of very, very dramatic plans, uh, landscaping plans and uh, uh, landscape designs uh, for the area around Lower Lake and the Shaker Parklands. And one of the things that has um, caught our eye and lasted so long is in 1921, the Shaker Lakes Garden Club, still a very active garden club, uh, requested a resolution from city council uh, to establish the Shaker Wildflower Preserve. And the area that they designated is the area highlighted in blue. And this area is on the west end of Lower Lake. Here is the original 1836 dam. And just on the other side of the dam where the sawmill ruins are and the spillway headed under Coventry Boulevard, the Shaker Lakes Garden Club persuaded Cleveland City Council to adopt a resolution establishing this preserve. And one of the reasons that they did this was that they were concerned that wild flowers in the uh, Shaker Parklands were rapidly disappearing, including, as the newspaper article notes, uh, Trillium and Trailing Arbutus um, as two of our most spectacular wildflowers. Back in 1921, there were already concerns that these wildflowers uh, were disappear disappearing. Cleveland City Council has never revoked this resolution, and as a result, uh, this uh, triangular area just west of the dam continues to this day to be the Shaker Wildflower Preserve. In 1923, uh, the Garden Club, Club of Cleveland and the Shaker Lakes Garden Club made another proposal, and that proposal was for a Shaker Memorial Garden. And this garden was to be located at the tip of the triangular area, North Park and Coventry, today's North Park and Coventry, uh, in the Shaker Wildflower Preserve. So they looked at just the tip of it and said, we want to plant, design and plant 
a memorial to the Shakers, because this was a central part, this was a central place of the Mill family, and the sawmill ruins were the only thing that was left of the Shaker colony that was visible. Um, this garden was partially, maybe more than partially built. Um, when we go in there now, which is very difficult because uh, the area is a horrific tangle of invasive species, uh, vines and honeysuckle shrubbery and buckthorns and uh, some of the worst invasives that we have. And this is a complete tangle now. Uh, but when you get back into it, uh, back into the center of it, um, you can find, and we have found, um, some descendants of uh, the original plantings, uh, the hawthorns and the crab apples, um, uh, uh, some, of the, some of the trees and shrubs, as well as just a few shrubs left uh, from this original planting plan, as well as, as well as uh, remnants of the brick paths that were put in from brick, uh, from Brook Road and uh, from the uh, sawmill ruins, we can still find some evidence of uh, the brick paths that were once here. So this is something that was implemented uh, sometime after 1923, um, and then eventually fell into disrepair, and uh, sadly, the invasive species moved in and took over. So that entire area remains the Shaker Wildflower Preserve. It includes the wonderfully charming uh, 1923 footbridge uh, that a Mr. Brook, we don't know who that was, uh, donated the design for, and his employee, Reno Neuter, uh, built it for around $350. Good luck with that today. And in the background here, you can see the bridge where the Doan Brook goes under Coventry Road. And that bridge was installed by the WPA in 1941. But during the 20s and the early 1930s, the Shaker Lakes Garden Club in particular was very active in this area. In 1935, uh, A.D. Taylor, a landscape ar architect nationally known, uh, was hired by the Fairmount Garden Club to do a complete landscape plan for Lower Lake. And this is a remarkable document. Um, we're, we're going to post a, a link to it for those of you uh, who are interested in it. Uh, but once again, uh, here is the 500 foot original 1836 dam. Here is the 1897 bridge uh, over the spillway. And you can see by now, by 1935, that the spillway for the sawmill has been closed off as it is today. You don't find that anymore. Um, this is South Park Boulevard in Shaker Heights, and here's North Park Boulevard in Cleveland Heights. There are a couple of things that I find particularly interesting about this plan that, I, uh, that we wanted to share with you. And one of them is that uh, it was a plan that was probably mostly implemented in the late 1930s, we find descendants uh, of a lot of the plants that were planted there originally in and among the invasive species that have moved in, like flowering cherry trees and flowering crab, uh, crab apples and uh, very, very dramatic hawthorn trees uh, right here um, over by the old tennis court area. Uh, there's a, a cove of hawthorn trees here that are spectacular. And here it is marked on the 1935 map. And if you go to North Woodland, uh, the North Woodland Bridge, the Nature Center is on the right. If you go to North Woodland, there are still a few of the flowering dogwoods that mark the southern entrance to Lower Shaker Lake Park. Uh, a few of those dogwoods are still there. So it's, it's very interesting to find almost 100 years later, the descendants or some of the original plantings still uh, extant. It's wonderful to see. And uh, that uh, this map does show A.D. Taylor did very carefully draw in the canoe club, the two-story building that I showed you earlier, um, and talked about all the things that were to be planted around that. But by 1935, the refreshment stand up here 
uh, somewhere up here was uh, was long gone and no, no trace of it appears on the map. So one of the things that I find so interesting here is what plantings were put in and the fact that lots of them are still there. Another thing that I find very interesting is that A.D. Taylor understood that part of the beauty of this area was the fact that at one point it was a ravine and because it was a ravine at one point, uh, even as a lake, it still had nice overlooks. And so here on North Woodland, um, a place that we have uh, caref uh, carefully cleared away invasive um, Japanese knotweed, uh, A.D. Taylor back in 1935 said, leave this area open, viewing down the lake so that we can view down the lake. And at the other end of the lake, um, he has a little note saying, remove privet. <laughs> and this was the first indication uh, that we've found uh, where anyone said, uh, let's start removing invasive uh, plants. But again, uh, for A.D. Taylor, that was to preserve the overlook. One of the other things that I think uh, many of you may, uh, uh, may remember is that on the South Park side of Lower Lake, on the Shaker Heights side, what's now the Shaker Heights side, uh, there are at least three stunningly old white oaks. Um, the one in the bottom left corner um, had a circumference of 200 inches. It came down in the microburst in uh, September of 2019. Uh, but uh, as best we can estimate, uh, that tree started as an acorn uh, sometime around 1700. Uh, the tree in the middle, uh, pictured in the middle, uh, maybe in around 1750, an acorn um, sprouted. And on the right side, uh, just behind the old tennis courts um, off of uh, South Park in the intersection of South Park and Larchmere, uh, a tree around 1725. And so this area has some enormously old trees that A.D. Taylor incorporated into his, uh, into his map and into his plan. In 1940, uh, the Cleveland City landscape architect, Proctor Noyes, uh, did a plan for um, the parklands of the city of Cleveland. And what I find so interesting about this uh, is that Shaker Heights Park is the largest park by acreage of all the parks in the city of Cleveland. And so uh, an area that uh, uh, was uh, donated uh, back in the 1890s um, is, um, 40 years later, is still the largest park in the uh, city of Cleveland's uh, park system. Proctor Noyes did uh, quite a lot of uh, development proposals uh, for activity centers and things like that. Uh, but here you can see is uh, our beloved Lower Lake with the Canoe Club building still on it, uh, the dam uh, and the uh, Shaker Wildflower Preserve uh, still extant. And for that Shaker Wildflower Preserve, uh, Proctor Noyes went a step farther. And he said, we are going to put in the Shaker Wildflower Preserve the Shaker Bird Sanctuary and Wildflower Preserve Museum. And so he uh, designed, and, and this, was, this was never built, a two-story museum to go right off of Brook Road. So Lower Lake is here. This is uh, Brook Road. Uh, this is the entrance into what would have been a charming little two-story building with a museum and laboratory on the first floor and a museum room and offices on the second floor. And in his mind, the old sawmill ruins, the old Shaker sawmill ruins were a perfect place for what was then called the council area. The designs show something that we might call an amphitheater today. But in 1940, the Shaker Bird Sanctuary and Wildflower Preserve uh, was proposed by the city of Cleveland's uh, landscape architect. Uh, and unfortunately, uh, World War II intervened or uh, it was at the end of the depression or almost at the end of the depression and times were tough. 
uh, but this building was never erected uh, on the site. And the sawmill ruins today uh, are flooded because there's no exit from, uh, from that very, very low spot where the old sawmill stood. Uh, the Shaker Lakes Garden Club way back in 1927 uh, put some stone benches in there and those benches remain, but most of the year now they're unusable because of uh, the volume of water um, accumulating in the, in the foundation. In the late 1940s, after World War II, uh, the city of Cleveland leased the Shaker Parklands, uh, the northern side to Cleveland Heights and the southern side to Shaker Heights uh, for a dollar a year uh, for long-term leases. And in return, uh, the cities agreed to perform maintenance um, on their respective parts of the Shaker Parklands. Uh, but the city of Cleveland continues to own the parklands all the way up the Doan Brook to Warrensville Center Road and Southerly Park. That's land all owned by the city of Cleveland. But the parklands, the Doan Brook watershed parklands, uh, are leased to the cities of Shaker Heights and Cleveland Heights. In the 1950s and the 1960s, canoeing remained popular on the lake. Uh, we can remember uh, activities around the canoe club at that time. And uh, we have a marvelous oral history from the last Commodore of the canoe club, uh, a man who uh, told us that the responsibilities of the Commodore were to keep the snack bar uh, well stocked and also unfortunately to uh, empty the buckets that passed for toilets in the canoe club. So it wasn't exactly the, the glamor that the Commodore title um, uh, seems to convey. Uh, in the 1960s, as probably most of you know, uh, the county engineer Albert Porter uh, proposed putting seven or putting five uh, interstate freeways through the east side of Cleveland and the east side suburbs. And two of those freeways, the Clark Freeway and the Lee Freeway, would have cut right through uh, Lower Lake and the Shaker Parklands would have destroyed the Shaker Parklands. Uh, his proposal in 1963 was met with a storm of opposition from uh, the residents of that part of the city of Cleveland, from Cleveland Heights and Shaker Heights. Um, the garden clubs rose up in protest. Uh, political entities rose up in protest. Um, the people who founded what is now the Nature Center at Shaker Lakes, uh, were absolutely wonderful citizen scientists who did lots of surveys of the scientific uh, value of the parklands. And uh, the proposal to build the interstates arose in 1963, but for seven years, the battle went on um, and the uh, Shaker uh, Lakes Nature Center built its original building while those freeways were still uh, on the active to be built map. So it was just a very bold and courageous move to raise $100,000 to put the Nature Center up, even though that was the site of what was to be the, inter, uh, the interchange of the Lee Freeway and the Clark Freeway. But in 1970, Governor Rhodes canceled all the freeways on the east side of Cleveland. Uh, they were never built and the Nature Center and the Shaker Parklands uh, were preserved. Not so much for the Canoe Club, unfortunately. Uh, the membership of the Canoe Club dwindled through the late 1960s and early 70s. Uh, Shaker Heights, now this land was leased to Shaker Heights, uh, Shaker Heights required the Canoe Club to bring the building up to its building codes, which included completely rewiring the building, uh, putting in uh, the appropriate heating equipment, which was uh, rudimentary at best, and also putting in running water and putting in sewer lines um, so that they weren't emptying buckets in the lake anymore. Uh, the Canoe Club membership couldn't support that. They couldn't uh, raise the funds to do that. Uh, and the city and the Canoe, Shaker Heights and the Canoe Club went back and forth for years 
And finally, in 1976, uh, Shaker said that all attempts to put the building on the National Register of Historic Places had failed. Uh, they authorized the Shaker Heights Fire Department to practice cutting through a roof using the canoe club as its practice site. And then finally, the Harris Wrecking Company took the canoe club building down. For a little while, the porch and the deck and the marvelous uh, logs that were used as uh, porch supports stood up, uh, but eventually those became unsafe uh, and, uh, and they too came down. So we're into the 1970s now. Let's take, uh, take a, a deep breath here and say, uh, that when we look at Lower Lake, it does uh, break into a couple of broad categories of activities. Um, in the middle of the 1800s, the Shaker settlement used uh, Lower Lake and built Lower Lake and used that lake entirely for commerce, for industry. Uh, they never would have put that dam in place if they uh, didn't want to run a sawmill and a woolen mill and, and a grist mill. Um, so for them, it was industry. It was all commerce. And then starting in about 1896, uh, when the beautification of parklands, the beautification of cities uh, efforts was moving across the country, the city of Cleveland uh, commissioned through uh, the Garden Club's commission, but uh, with the support of the city of Cleveland, numerous landscape plans that were uh, put into place um, and, and Lower Lake became uh, just a beautiful example of a wonderful uh, city park and uh, was also used as a great marketing tool by the uh, real estate companies that were trying to uh, sell houses around it. And then uh, after World War II, there, were, uh, there was a lot less interest in beautification programs, a lot more interest in uh, the quality of water, water quality water pollution, uh, cutting back on water pollution, um, and the plants in the park and the plantains in the park uh, fell behind and fell prey to uh, invasive species. So where are we now? Well, uh, politically, it's a little bit difficult. It's a little bit complicated. Um, down in the bottom, this is uh, an NERSD map of, of uh, Lower Lake. Down in the bottom right-hand corner, is North Woodland Road, a bridge there that was built by the county engineer, Albert Porter, after the freeways were defeated. Thank you, Mr. Porter. Um, the county maintains this bridge as it does with uh, most bridges. The red line cutting through the lake divides the lake in half, Cleveland Heights on the north side, Shaker Heights on the south side. And so each city has uh, authority over and responsibility for uh, through leases, not through ownership, um, for the parklands on their side of the lake. Brook Road, or Lover's Lane, uh, is the old 1836 dam, and that is under the jurisdiction of the Ohio Department of Natural Resources. And finally, the water flowing through the Doan Brook and into Lower Lake and out of Lower Lake is under the jurisdiction of the Northeast Ohio Regional Sewer District. And so you can see from this uh, somewhat uh, tangled lines of responsibility for this part and that part, um, that it's a big effort to coordinate activities around the lake. And then we add a little bit of additional complexity because uh, this entire area is part of the Shaker Village National Historic Register, uh, National Register Historic District. And so it's a historic district as well. And I, uh, I tell you all this because uh, it's very uh, important to understand that there's no one party that says, uh, here's a final decision on this or on that uh, about uh, Lower Lake and the Shaker Parklands. Uh, it's a very complicated uh, structure. No garden is an island. And this picture of the 1897 bridge from 2018 um, is one of the reasons that the Friends of Lower Lake uh, started to work. Uh, there are no native plants in this picture. These are all invasive species. 
Most of the species you see here are on uh, the banned invasive plants list that the state of Ohio publishes. Uh, most of them are extremely aggressive. And as you can see, they are taking over uh, the 1897 bridge. And had nothing been done, this 1897, this side of the 1897 bridge probably would have some, at some point have disappeared um, into the jungle. The Friends of Lower Lake started in 2018 simply by restoring habitat, removing the invasive species, and planting species native to Northeast Ohio in the places that we took out the invasives. We just happened to start in the upper left-hand corner in this flat area that was covered in porcelain berry and shrubby Japanese honeysuckle. By July of 2018, we'd uncovered a part of the Canoe Club Foundation, uh, including uh, close to 20 inches of uh, silt inside the uh, Canoe Club Foundation. By November, we'd excavated the entire Canoe Club Foundation. And you can see in the bottom right, uh, in June of 2020, uh, a large number of native trees and shrubs and flowers are in place. And we were beginning to see good populations of butterflies and hummingbirds and uh, numerous other pollinators. Taking a step back for a moment, what is an invasive plant? An invasive plant is not native to Ohio, but it's one that spreads rapidly and aggressively and it displaces the native flora. Uh, there are approximately 100 species in Ohio that are con considered invasive. Um, there are lots of lists of these plants and how to remove them. Uh, quite a few of them started out as landscaping plants, uh, going all the way back to the 1700s, uh, before we realized how much they, would, uh, they could spread and how aggressively they would spread. Um, looking at some definitions uh, for plants, a native species is one that's indigenous to the geographic region, plants that co-evolved with our local insects and birds. Non-native or introduced species have been transported across geographic boundaries. And here in Ohio, Northeast Ohio, daffodils and lilacs would fall into that. And one category or subcategory of invasive plants, uh, of non-native plants rather, are invasive species that outcompete other species causing damage to an ecosystem. And it can be a native or a non-native species, but we usually call aggressive natives uh, simply aggressive rather than invasive uh, because they don't have quite the same takeover everything. Uh, but invasive species include European buckthorn, Japanese bush honeysuckle, and lily of the valley. We have areas around Lower Lake where the lily of the valley has uh, killed off all the spring wildflowers and the only thing that successfully coexists with lily of the valley, unfortunately, is poison ivy. Uh, the problem with these non-native plants, they don't support our native insects. And you may have read over the last couple of years about the insect apocalypse and how insect populations are plummeting. And many of these non-native plants have nectar and fruits that do nothing for our birds or our insects. They might as well be junk food. And one of the metrics we use are, is anything eating the leaves? Because if there are no insects eating the leaves of the plants we have, that means there are no insects around. We're not supporting any kind of biodiversity. Here's a, uh, a collage of four different places around Lower Lake that were turning into monocultures. One species was taking over an area and killing off everything under it, all the native plants and any other plants uh, that tried to grow up. And these are areas that we've attacked to remove the invasive plants and replace them with native plants. We've cleared off the 1897 bridge area in spite of attempts for it to grow back. The Canoe Club Foundation is now open and we plant and we plant and we plant. We cannot leave bare ground because the invasives will simply move back in. Uh, and so we uh, continue to plant wherever possible. Uh, we have a group uh, that over time has encompassed over 200 individuals at various times, uh, working primarily on Sunday mornings from 10 to about one o'clock. Uh, it's all volunteer uh, group, 
uh, it's an all volunteer group uh, and it's a wonderful group to work with. Uh, we've learned a lot from each other uh, and we are looking forward to uh, restoring the habitat around Lower Lake uh, back to one that includes uh, primarily natives to Northeast Ohio. This picture was taken this spring of the uh, Canoe Club Foundation uh, with native trees and shrubs coming up uh, around it uh, with that beautiful vista of Lower Lake. We do think that the original 1907 Canoe Club founders picked this site on Lower Lake as the most beautiful site uh, on Lower Lake. It is, uh, it's just stunning. Um, in 2021, Lower Lake does remain a very, very special place, uh, the uh, Lower Lake Parklands. The original 1836 dam that stopped up the Doan Brook for industrial use for just a few decades is now out of compliance with current Ohio Department of Natural Resources standards. Because it is a class one earthen dam, it is very serious, potentially life-threatening to those downstream, to have it be out of compliance, particularly in a time when we have increased water volume coming through the Doan Brook as the result of um, increased frequency and intensity of storms. So this is a problem. The Northeast Ohio Regional Sewer District has been conducting engineering and scientific studies in the Doan Brook watershed for several years with a focus on the Shaker Lakes. And in uh, just a few, uh, uh, just a week or two now, the sewer district will present its recommendations for the lakes to the cities and to the general population um, of the cities, both to the council of Shaker Heights, councils of Shaker Heights and Cleveland Heights, as well as to the general population. And we'll give you the dates and times of those meetings in a minute. But whatever these recommendations are that any ORSD comes out with, and which of those recommendations are accepted and over some period of time implemented, the rich human history and the natural history of the Lower Lake Parklands remains fascinating. And we, the Friends of Lower Lake, believe very firmly that sustainable stewardship of the lands around the lake must continue. So June 14th and June 15th, there will be meetings sponsored by the Northeast Ohio Regional Sewer District to discuss their Shaker Lakes review and recommendations. The link has been, uh, Peggy is putting the link in the chat box now uh, for these meetings. Um, this, the joint council meeting is Monday, June 14th, and then uh, and that's public viewing only. And then on Tuesday, June 15th at 6.30, there'll be a public meeting with audience questions. Uh, so the link is here. If you're interested in um, hearing what the sewer district is recommending uh, for this part of the Shaker Parklands uh, over the next decade, uh, please attend these meetings. We'd also like to invite uh, people on the call to join us uh, on our Sunday morning work sessions. We also now have midweek work sessions uh, where some of our volunteers are getting together on Tuesdays and Thursdays and working around Lower Lake. You can email us at friendsoflowerlake at gmail.com and follow us on Facebook. Um, it's a great group. Something else that I'd like to share with you is that Cleveland Heights Parks and Recreation has now put together a wonderful self-guided Lower Lake historical hiking tour. Uh, the link is here on this slide. Peggy's putting the link into the chat box as well. Uh, but so many of the things that, that we've talked about tonight um, can be uh, seen by taking this Lower Shaker hiking tour um, through your uh, smartphone or uh, tablet uh, and going around the lake and seeing some of the history that we've talked about tonight. We've also shown you a wide array of Lower Lake historic maps. Um, and once again, there's a link to find those maps electronically, or you can go down to the absolutely wonderful map room at the downtown Cleveland Public Library. Thank you so much for your attention tonight. Thank you, John. Uh, I have 
three questions from the chat. And if anybody else has anything else, please type it up. Uh, first question is, do you know if Rockefeller moved away from Cleveland when he made the gift of the parks or was he still in town? Uh, I believe he was still in town when he did that. Uh, but I do wanna emphasize that uh, uh, he was splitting his time between uh, Cleveland and New York. And at the specific time of the donation, I don't know, he was there for the um, centennial celebration for the city of Cleveland when the announcement was made uh, that he was donating those lands uh, down in the gorge uh, to the city of Cleveland to help it, uh, to help it make that trail of parks. Okay, uh, second question is, why was the Shaker Heights Land Co. located in Buffalo? Uh, that was a company that seemed to be following the Shakers around the country in the late 1800s, around the eastern part of the country, because they did uh, land deals with other Shaker colonies, as in general, the entire Shaker population uh, collapsed into fewer and fewer and fewer colonies. Uh, the Shaker Heights land uh, company seemed to be there to purchase the land or help uh, sell the land for development or whatever. Uh, they seem to be uh, uh, seem to be following the, the the dying colonies almost like an ambulance ch chaser. Hmm. Um, somebody has asked about what's gonna be happening with the sewer district and the general answer is please attend the meeting. Uh, we are not at an ability to say anything. So please attend the general meeting for information. And um, obviously there will probably be discussion about it after uh, June 15th. Uh, moving forward, uh, what do you know about the car that was found in uh, Lower Lake? No. <laughs> um. <clears throat> Wow, um, the car was, uh, it was a uh, 2007 something or other stolen in the city of Cleveland, uh, pushed out, probably pushed out through the uh, earthen canoe launch by the dam, uh, pushed out into the lake with the windows rolled down and it floated for a little while uh, and then sank, uh, sank down in the um, uh, down nose first down in the lake. Uh, it managed to sink almost exactly on the dividing line between the um, city of Cleveland, I mean, the uh, city of Shaker Heights and the city of Cleveland Heights responsibilities. Uh, and we understand that there were some lively discussions about which police department was going to uh, investigate uh, um, and tow the car back out. Uh, but, but again, it was stolen in Cleveland and abandoned, probably pushed out into the lake. Uh, empty and eventually sank uh, after it floated for a little while. Quite a story when it emerged uh, after they were uh, draining the lake for one of the dam repair processes. Uh, how deep is the lake, generally speaking? Uh, the lake itself, uh, the water in the lake itself, um, is probably no deeper than six feet. Uh, there's an enormous accumulation of silt. Uh, when the lake is drained, uh, the deepest uh, part of what's left is the original channel of the Doan Brook, uh, because at one time this was a, a, a beautiful steep ravine, a uh, wooded steep ravine. Uh, but over time, uh, silt from construction up in Beechwood and Shaker Heights and Cleveland Heights and other places um, ended up in the Doan Brook, flowed uh, down through uh, the Doan Brook all the way to Lower Lake, and as soon as the water slowed down in the breadth of uh, Lower Lake, it dropped its silt, and that's why there's now an island uh, just on the other side of the North Woodland uh, Bridge, on the Lower Lake side of the North Woodland Bridge, uh, is silt that has been carried down by the Doan, Doan Brook and piled up there. Okay, um, I'm getting a lot of, uh, somebody's asking about water pollution in Doan Brook. Um, yes, there is water pollution because we still have storm water. I mean, we still have storm water runoff. Um, so whether that be fertilizer into the lake and also just overflow from the combined sewer, uh, that is and will be an issue. Um, 
it fluctuates depending on the season. Obviously, when there's a lot of rain, uh, the levels are higher. But in general, it is much better than it has been in the past. Uh, Tori, do you want to add anything to that statement? <laughs> <laughs> nice job. Yeah. Um, thanks, yeah, no, just to clarify, the combined sewer overflows are not in the lower lake section of Dome Brook. They're downstream. There are a few in the Dome Brook Gorge. And then there are unfortunately several in um, along Rockefeller Park. However, the, the new interceptor tunnel that's going in at Ambler Park downstream from Lower Lake will greatly vastly reduce the amount of um, sewer overflow to something like 2% of what it is today, which is, is great news when that comes online. I know that's still um, in the works. And, and then it just, you know, as Elizabeth said, being in such an urban setting with so much runoff from our uh, impervious cover services will almost <laughs> guarantee that there'll be that there will be bacteria etc finding its way into our local streams well cool. um are there any plans to coordinate events of lower lake and the parks with the upcoming coming 2022 Olmsted bicentennial celebrations i'm gonna say thank you for letting us know about this and maybe <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and somebody's asking, do you know when Sugar Heights Country Club began and if this impacted canoeing at Lower Lake? Um, I do not know when the uh, Country Club uh, was, uh, was founded. It was advertised early on uh, in the 1920s, I believe, as an, amen as an amenity uh, for Shaker Heights uh, house sales in Van Swearingen, um, advertisements. Um, so uh, it, it's been around a long time. I don't know how long, perhaps uh, uh, somebody, if they know that, will put that in the chat box. I just Googled uh, it 1913. So I guess with the timeline, that would make sense with it being really popular with the Ben Schwerick and Brothers promoting their housing development. Yes. Thank you. No problem. Um, on that note, can you kayak or canoe on Lower Lake? The answer is yes, you can. It is the only Shaker Lake uh, that this is permitted on. Um, there is the Canoe Club boat launch, and there is also uh, a shoreline launch uh, down by the dam where you can put in uh, kayaks uh, and canoes without, uh, without threatening vegetation, damaging vegetation. Uh, the one caution is that uh, even though the water is uh, virtually two to three feet deep in most places, uh, the muddy silt is extremely deep. And uh, if you, for any reason, capsize or try to step out of a canoe or a kayak, um, you're less likely to drown than you are to get stuck in the mud. And the mud is, the silt is very, very soft and very, very deep in Lower Lake. Be careful. And somebody also asked about paddle boarding and I'm assuming it's the same thing as the kayaks and canoes. Please be careful yeah. folks, this is at your own risk. Um, yeah. There is a question about, is there any talk of expanding to the other Shaker Lakes? I guess they're talking about doing invasive work. Uh, if that is your question, if you can ex like expand on that question, please do. Um, I think that might be what they're asking. I bet I, it's uh, the way I read it is, John, um, do you have any interest in uncovering the history of the rest of the lakes? Um, well, certainly, certainly because um, all the other Shaker lakes are upstream of us. That means that the predominant invasive species, the, the massive invasive species upstream from us is always going to be uh, causing us problems until we can remove them upstream because one of the vectors for the seeds and plant pieces of these invasive species is uh, flooding waters. Uh, so it would be good and we hope at some point that other volunteer groups will, uh, will rise up to uh, work around the other shaker lakes and improve the habitat around the other shaker lakes. Uh, it is uh, desperately needed and we'll be happy to work with uh, uh, volunteers 
and help train volunteers who might want to attack uh, some of the problems at the other Shaker Lakes. Um, somebody was asking if there are plans to dredge the lake. Uh, the sewer district has mentioned that idea. Um, as of right now, there's nothing on schedule for something that extreme, but it is an idea to help with silt control. Uh, and then of course, we've got two fish questions. Uh, the first is how did the fish get there? They were stocked. <laughs> And the second is what is going on with the initiative to stock the lower lake? Still in discussion between the two cities, but if you like to go fishing, you can go down the street to Rockefeller Park Lagoon. Happy to say that Dunbrook has been stocking since April. Um, it coincides with our fishing workshops. The next one is June 26. There's another one September 11th, and there's a third October 23rd. And the next one will be bluegill and then the the uh <laughs> sorry <laughs> and the next one and then the one after that will be catfish and bluegill and then the october date is going to be trout so you don't need a license to fish there so please uh either attend our events or take a pull yourself and go fishing and then what else is in the chat uh how are population pollution levels these days in the lake high lower than in the past definitely lower than in the past um, there's been a lot of effort with individuals and cities and the EPA to make sure that the water that we are living near is much healthier than it was in the 1800s or even in the, you know, the 1960s, for sure. <laughs> um, when the lake was drained a few weeks ago, there were a lot of old bottles. Why so many? Well, if you, uh, uh, if you think that uh, if you remember that Lower Lake has been in existence at various water levels since 1836, um, it has also unfortunately been uh, something of a trash dump uh, on and off over the years, particularly with uh, long lived things like bottles and plastic. And so the lake bed itself, uh, we see as, as uh, very dangerous if you're walking around in flip flops or tennis shoes or something like that because of the enormous amount of broken glass um, that uh, sits on the bottom of the lake. Uh, but we also found um, a dot matrix uh, printer. Of course, a car was found uh, and all a uh, fire hose uh, was uh, down at the bottom of the lake. Um, no human remains have been uncovered so far, but we found just about everything else. Um, I feel like the chat is going quiet. Uh, if anyone is interested in getting on Lower Lake and they don't own a boat or a paddle boat, we're happy to announce we will be doing a modified version of our Take to the Lake event August 28th. Uh, please check our website and socials, Facebook, uh, in the coming weeks or so for information. Um, if, I don't know. For the good of the order, I, I think we're I think we're gonna yes, thank take a night. I just <laughs> I just want to say an, another big hearty thanks to our wonderful volunteers, Peggy Spaith and John Barber for, um, as I said earlier, digging in both to the earth and the history. And, I'll, and if I may just close, I love this quote from one of the volunteers that works alongside Peggy and John. They say these two are an absolutely tremendous team, encouraging, inspiring, instigating and educating it's gratifying it's a gratifying experience to work with them on the friends of lower lake project so uh, i think we see that echoed with the flood of um accolades that are coming in the chat so um keep going guys thank you thank you thank all you elizabeth for organizing this thank you everyone for attending um and we hope to see you in person soon <laughs> good night